How, how, how would you recommend that we assess the elderly for malnutrition? We happen to live here in an affluent area, but, but it's still not uncommon, even here, but in other areas of the country where it may be more common, what would be ways that doctors could assess the nutritional status of their patients? Well, there are um, uh, documents like the, uh, I think it's Nestle that put out what, uh, what we shared before, the mini nutrition assessment. So it's a pretty basic assessment with a very simple, simple questionnaire that they can just give their patients or go through with their patients. And it asks a very basic questions just about mobility, you know, stress, um, access to food. And so based on the rating system, if they score a certain amount of points, then it indicates whether they're, you know, moderate risk or at risk. And then they can, using those forms, um, kind of have at least some indication, at least they're asking what's going on, might be going on in their home environment, how much they're eating, what, they're, what the factors are at home. Yeah. Yeah. We can put that on our website so people could download it. Yeah, uh, that would that, be great. The Nestle assessment. I just want to mention that many times patients going into the hospital have um, are assessed for nutrition at that time, but not when they leave the hospital. So, and they've often gotten worse, you know, nutritionally or immune-wise or whatever, and they're getting sent home and they're in a very um, precarious state. Yeah. And they may not have the right food at home, or they may not, you know, have a condition where they're not chewing that well, or they're whatever it may be. Yeah, it, it's, it's absurd to think that we could spend $50,000 on a hospitalization and have the person go home and have it undone in a week yep. because the person has no one at home or no food at home or they get handed a stack of papers and prescriptions, but they don't really know what any of this stuff means. Yes. It's uh, the proliferation of paperwork given the people when they leave the hospital is unbelievable. Yeah. So much of it that it just leads to overload, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. What other things would you, would you recommend doctors do to assess the, the, the nutritional status of their patients? I mean, you can look at basic lab work, um, but there are some things that, you know, in terms of iron status and um, albumin levels and things like that, but one thing that I find gets overlooked often are B12 levels because the range of B12 is something like 200 to 900, but at, as an elderly person, um, who has low stomach acid and they may be under certain medications that are interfering with B12 absorption like metformin. Mm -hmm. One in 20 patients who are on metformin can have B12 issues, but it's not going to get flagged unless it's less than 200. Yeah, but as you know, there can be many um, issues of fatigue, um, dementia, uh, you know, neurolo other neurological issues with B12 levels that are 350. Yeah. Um, and so they just think the B12 is fine and then they are getting all, having all these, you know, compromised situations. Yeah, we, we sometimes forget about B12, I think. We look at albumin, of course, but right. what other laboratory studies might be recommended? Um, vitamin D levels. Um, there's a lot of research now just about immune status and heart health and cancer prevention. So making sure vitamin D is, is good. Another thing that I see that often gets overlooked is magnesium. The problem with magnesium, though, is that there's only 1% magnesium that's in the blood. Yeah. So a magnesium level might come back normal, but again, that's not going to really show whether it's compromised or not because it's going to pull it from the bones and the tissues and the muscles just to make sure that the serum is, is within range. Yeah. So I find if you do an RBC magnesium, that can sometimes be better. But with all my, my patients, I always have them having higher magnesium foods, trying to make sure that they're getting that because stress is, interferes with magnesium absorption. Um, and, you know, many other medications and... Um, diuretics. Diuretics. Um, and magnesium is involved in like 300 reactions in the body. So it affects the bones and the brain and, and energy levels, um, uh, digestion. So this, this can get overlooked too. Yeah, I, I was always taught magnesium was ubiquitous in the diet, that the magnesium is found in so many foods that it's really hard to become magnesium deficient unless you're uh, alcoholic or something like that. But And that's not true. Yeah, but that's not true. Right, because it's in green leafy vegetables and nuts and seeds and whole grains and things that, that many of these people may not be getting enough of in their diet.